stories about black history, 10 things your child should know, and computer science courses, all things you can learn more about on blackineducation.com. In the creation of this healthier public sentiment, the Afro-American can do for himself what no one else can do for him. The world looks on with wonder that we have conceded so much and remain law-abiding under such great outrage and provocation. To Northern capital and Afro-American labor, the South owes its rehabilitation. If labor is withdrawn, capital will not remain. The Afro-American is thus the backbone of the South. A thorough knowledge and judicious exercise of this power in lynching localities could many times affect a bloodless revolution. The white man's dollar is his God, and to stop this would be to stop outrages in many localities. The Afro-Americans of Memphis denounced the lynching of three of their best citizens and urged and waited for the authorities to act in the matter and bring the lynchers to justice. No attempt was made to do so, and the black men left the city by thousands, bringing about great stagnation in every branch of business. Those who remained so injured the business of the streetcar company by staying off the cars that the superintendent, manager, and treasurer called personally on the editor of the free speech, asked them to urge our people to give them their patronage again. Other businessmen became alarmed over the situation, and the free speech was run away that the colored people might be more easily controlled. A meeting of white citizens in June, three months after the lynching, passed resolutions for the first time condemning it. But they did not punish the lynchers. Every one of them was known by name because they had been selected to do the dirty work by some of the various citizens who passed these resolutions. Memphis is fast losing her black population, who proclaim as they go that there is no protection for the life and property of any Afro-American citizen in Memphis who is not a slave. The Afro-American citizens of Kentucky, whose intellectual and financial improvement has been phenomenal, have never had a separate car law until now. Delegations and petitions poured into the legislature against it. Yet the bill passed, and the Jim Crow car of Kentucky is a legalized institution. Will the great mass of Negroes continue to patronize the railroad? A special from Covington, Kentucky says. Covington, June 13th. The railroads of the state are beginning to feel very markedly the effects of the separate coach bill recently passed by the legislature. No class of people in the state have so many and so largely attended excursions as the blacks. All these have been abandoned and regular travel was reduced to a minimum. A competent authority says the loss to the various roads will reach $1 million this year. A call to a state conference in Lexington, Kentucky last June had delegates from every county in the state. Those delegates, the ministers, teachers, heads of secret and other orders, and the head of every family should pass the word around for every member of the race in Kentucky to stay off railroads unless obliged to ride. If they did so and their advice was followed persistently, the convention would not need to petition the legislature to repeal the law or raise money to file a suit. The railroad corporations would be so affected they would in self-defense lobby to have the separate car law repealed. On the other hand, as long as the railroads can get African-American excursions, they will always have plenty of money to fight all the lawsuits brought against them. They will be aided in so doing by the same partisan public sentiment which passed the law. White men passed the law and white judges and jurors would pass upon the suits against the law and render judgment in line with their prejudices and in deference to the greater financial power. The appeal to the white man's pocket has ever been more effectual than all appeals ever made to his conscience. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is to be gained by a further sacrifice of manhood and self-respect. By the right exercise of his power and the industrial fact of the South, the Afro-American can demand and secure his rights, the punishment of lynchers and a fair trial for all accused rapists. Of the many inhumane outrages of this present year, the only case where the proposed lynching did not occur was where the men armed themselves in Jacksonville, Florida and Paducah, Kentucky and prevented it. The only times an Afro-American who was assaulted got away has been when he had a gun and used it in self-defense. The lesson this teaches us and which every Afro-American should ponder well is that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home and it should be used for that protection which the law refuses to give. When the white man who is always the aggressor knows he runs as great a risk of biting the dust 
every time his Afro-American victim does, he will have greater aspect of respect for African-American life. The more the African-American yields and cringes and begs, the more he has to do so, the more he is insulted, outraged, and lynched. The assertion has been sustained throughout these pages that the press contains unreliable and doctored reports about lynching. And one of the most necessary things for the race is to get these facts before the public. The people must know before they can act, and there is no educator to compare with the press. The Afro-American papers are the only ones which will print the truth, and they lack means to employ agents and detectives to get at the facts. The race must rally a mighty host to the support of their journals, and thus enable them to do much in the way of investigation. A lynching occurred at Port Jarvis, New York, the first week in June. A white and colored man were implicated in the assault upon a white girl. It was charged that the white man paid the colored boy to make the assault, which he did on the public highway in broad daytime, and was lynched. This, too, was done by parties unknown. The white man in the case still lives. He was in prison and promises to fight the case on trial. At the preliminary examination, it developed that he had been a suitor of the girls. She had repulsed and refused him, yet had given money to him, and he had sent threatening letters demanding more. The day before this examination, she was so wrought up, she left home and wandered miles away. When found, she said she did so because she was afraid of the man's testimony. Why should she be afraid of the prisoner? Why should she yield to his demands for money if not to prevent him exposing something he knew? It seems explainable only on the hypothesis that a liaison existed between the colored boy and the girl, and the white man knew of it. The press is singularly silent. Has it a motive? We owe it to ourselves to find out. The story comes from Larned, Kansas, October 1, that a young white lady held at bay until daylight without alarming anyone in the house, a burly Negro who entered her room in bed. The burly Negro was promptly lynched without investigation or examination of inconsistent stories. A house was found burned down near Montgomery, Alabama, in Monroe County, October 13, a few weeks ago. Also, the burned bodies of the owners and melted pots of gold and silver. These discoveries led to the conclusion that the awful crime was not prompted by motives of robbery. The suggestion of the whites was that brutal lust was the incentive. And as there are nearly 200 Negroes living within a radius of five miles of the place, the conclusion was inevitable that some of them were the perpetrators. Upon this suggestion, probably made by the real criminal, the mob acted upon the conclusion and arrested 10 Afro-Americans, four of whom, they tell the world, confessed to the deed of murdering Richard L. Johnson and outraging his daughter, Jeanette. These four men, Burrell Jones, Moses Johnson, Jim and John Parker, none of them 25 years of age, upon this conclusion were taken from jail, hanged, shot, and burned while yet alive the night of October 12th. The same report says Mr. Johnson was on the best of terms with his Negro tenants. The race thus outraged must find out the facts of this awful hurling of men into eternity upon supposition and give them to the indifferent and apathetic country. We feel this to be a garbled report, but how can we prove it? Near Vicksburg, Mississippi, a murder was committed by a gang of burglars. Of course, it must have been done by Negroes, and Negroes were arrested for it. It is believed that two men, Smith Tooley and John Adams, belonged to a gang controlled by white men, and fearing exposure on the night of July 4, they were hanged in the courthouse yard by those interested in silencing them. Robberies since committed in the same vicinity have been known to be by white men who had their faces blackened. We strongly believe in the innocence of these murdered men, but we have no proof. No other news goes out to the world save that which stamps us as a race of cutthroats, robbers, and lustful wild beasts. So great is Southern hate and prejudice, they legally hung poor little 13-year-old Mildred Brown at Columbia, South Carolina, October 7, on the circumstantial evidence that she poisoned a white infant. If her guilt had been proven unmistakably, had she been white, Mildred Brown would never have been hung. The country would have been aroused and South Carolina disgraced forever for such a crime. The Afro-American himself did not know, as he should have known, as his journals should be in a position to have him know and to act. Nothing is more definitely settled than he must act for himself. I have shown how he may employ the boycott, immigration, and the press, 
and I feel that by a combination of all these agencies can be effectually stamped out lynch law, the last relic of barbarism and slavery. The gods help those who help themselves. <laughs>